I swear to God, this is the oddest story. <laughs> and if I just said the two words, Jacob and wrestling, you would know exactly which story I was talking about without me even telling you. But this is an odd story, at least the way it's told in the Bible. And I think it's important to know just a tiny bit about where Jacob was at the point where this happened to him, because he wasn't in a great place. He had a lot of family drama. He was having family drama with his twin brother Esau. He was having family drama with his father-in-law. And he was a little bit on the run at the moment. And he wasn't in a particularly powerful place. You know, this is Jacob, one of the patriarchs, but he wasn't in that position yet. And if you looked at this point in his life story, you would wonder if he would ever get there. And the story says that he had taken his whole family and all his stuff, his, his animals, and he had taken them across the river, the Jabbok River, presumably to a place that might be just a little bit safer, and he took them all over there, forded across the river. But he didn't go across the river. He came back and he stayed on that side, and this is where the story gets strange. Because it just says, he wrestled with a man all night. What is that supposed to mean? Now, hearing the story over and over again, we've come to understand this as, as some sort of godly presence that he was wrestling with, but there's nothing in the scripture that says that directly. It doesn't say he's wrestling with an angel. It doesn't say that. But he was wrestling with a man all night. And it obviously wasn't just any man, because when this other man realized that he couldn't prevail against Jacob after all this wrestling, and, you know, wrestling all night. First of all, it's exhausting. <laughs> but then this man, realizing that he couldn't prevail, he dislocated Jacob's hip. He pushed it right out of socket. Now, I don't know why he didn't use that trick earlier in the evening. <laughs> but he just dislocated his hip. And yet they struggled. And finally, this man said, let go of me. It's daybreak. And Jacob said, I won't let go of you until you bless me. And the man said, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. And the man said, no longer. Your name will now be Israel, which means God wrestler, because you have wrestled with God and you have stayed in there. And then Jacob said, what's your name? And the man said, why do you want to know my name? And just in that moment, he blessed Jacob. And the day broke. And Jacob named the spot where he had wrestled with something so deep and so powerful that it could knock his hip out of its socket. He named it Peniel, which means, I have been in the presence of God, and I have come out on the other side. And it said at the end of the story, he went on. He was limping because of the hip. And many of us know that, don't we? That hip thing. But he went on. So before I... Um found my way into the ministry, I worked in student affairs. I worked with college students for a long time. And I worked with residence life and student activities and judicial, pretty much all the non-academic parts of a college student experience. I was that person at orientation. If you are a parent who's recently gone to orientation with your incoming student, or if you recently were an incoming student, I was that person who would stand up in front of parents and say, I know you are really nervous 
about sending your son or daughter to school, and I know you're going to want to call us and find, us all, find out all kinds of information about how they're doing. I just need to tell you that we aren't going to be able to tell you that. And there's, you know, I explain the federal laws and the school's right to privacies um, that we accord students, and, and I explain, well, here's all the ways you can support your student, but we can't give you this information. All of that goes fine in orientation. Everyone says, yep, we get that. Inevitably, two weeks or so into the semester, I get a phone call from a distraught parent. My daughter is in an untenable roommate situation. I need for you to move her. My, and I explain kind of our process and that you really her, their daughter should come and talk to it. Well, we, she's tried that and I need to, and you know, the conversation would go and it's like, well, just give me her roommate's phone number so that I can call the roommate and talk to her. This is not, I need for my daughter to be in a better situation. Or my son has gotten himself in trouble and he's really a good kid and he needs to be, have an exemption through the judicial process. So I'd have these conversations with parents and I really, you know, with as much empathy um, and love as I can communicate over the phone because I really want them to understand how much I get that it's so hard to send out this um, being that you were there for their born and cry. You know, you've loved them and cared for them and nurtured them and been responsible for them and you want with everything in your being to protect them. And I would say, um, I, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you about that. Here's the ways you can support them. If they were still on the phone with me at that point, if they hadn't demanded to talk to my supervisor or been so frustrated to hang up, sometimes I would get to the point where I would talk with them about how I know this is really hard and I also know from the research and from my 15 years of working with college students that it's not just academic learning that happens in college. What also happens in college is students learn to struggle. They learn who they are and what they're made of. And it, it, it's important for them to have those struggles be their own. And sometimes if they were still on the phone with me, I'd tell them a story about Tony. Tony, who was such a great student when he came in his first year, and um, he got into a little bit of trouble, and that little bit of trouble escalated in a series of bad choices, some of his own making, some of his friends making. Anyway, it ended up that Tony lost his housing, lost his job, eventually dropped out of school, and was really angry. And I, and I lost track with Tony. I really liked Tony. I lost track with him. A few years later, actually it was like four years later, um, way after um, his class would have graduated, I was at an alumni function, and this person who looked kind of familiar came up to me. And he's like, Rachel, it's Tony, do you remember me? And I was like, Tony, oh my gosh, it's so great to see you. He'd graduated from a different college, and he just came back to say thank you. He came back to say, when that happened to me, I was so mad and scared. I thought this was the worst thing that could ever happen to me. I thought I would never survive. And I just came back to say, it is the best thing. And he goes on to tell me how he learned. And that story would re was repeated over and over and over again. Every time I would be at a graduation, I'd, walk stu I'd watch student after student walk across the stage, and I would know the struggles that they went through to make that happen. The incredible times when they didn't think they were going to survive. And there they were, getting their degree moving into an unknown future, but so proud of themselves. And the word that comes to mind when I think about those moments is resilience. What the quality that they had was resilience. Resilience is a big um, kind of word right now in parenting and in education. And whether you call it grit or perseverance or tenacity or resilience, researchers, social scientists, educational psychologists are all talking right now about how that quality in a person, that ability to rise from the ashes, that ability that when life knocks you down and your path gets um, removed from in front of you, that you somehow have the ability, the internal sense of self to make a new path and that sometimes you can create something better than what had come before. That quality of resilience is just as important that educators and psychologists are finding as IQ score not just for how happy or wholehearted our kids are, but how successful they are in all the traditional ways that we think about success. And the other thing about resilience, the only way it gets developed is through struggle. 
So if we're talking about stories of struggle and resilience, the story of Jacob is an excellent example. Because I agree with Phil, there's one, hardly any more dramatic story than the story of Jacob and his family. And there's a lot that's happened to Jacob before we get to this point, as Phil said. So as you know, he was a twin. So he has Esau was his brother, and they would, they, the, the scripture says that they fought in the womb. And that Esau came out first, he was the older brother, and Jacob was holding onto his heel. And that struggle continued. And, you know, Jacob, he, he, um, he, both he wasn't so excited about being the youngest child, and he did some devious and sneaky things, and he stole the birthright from his brother in a couple different ways. And his brother was not happy. In fact, the Bible says that he seethed with anger, and as soon as their father was going to die, Esau's plan was to kill his brother. So Jacob fled. So he left to his uncle's place where he lived for 20 years, got married, amassed a lot of wealth, um, and it became time, out of a series of events, it came time for him to go home. So when we find Jacob today on the banks of the river, it's the night before he's going to go home. But on the way home, he knows he's going to see his brother. His brother, when he left 20 years ago, was plotting to kill him. And Jacob has no idea and is, is imagining in his head that this time, I mean, maybe he's calmed down, but could be that he's continued to be furious and plotting. So he has no idea he's scared. So he um, takes his wealth and he sends, out, he sends out some messengers to meet Esau and say, your servant, your brother is coming to greet you. So the messengers come back and say, oh yeah, we saw Esau. He's coming with 400 men. So this is where Jacob is when we find him. He sends his his family across the stream, and he prays. And his prayer goes something like this. says, God, you've given me so much, and I know that I don't deserve it. I've made bad choices in my life, and I'm going to go meet my brother, and I'm really scared. I have no idea what's going to happen, and I need you to save me. Will you please save me from my brother? Save me from what's going to happen. You said that you would always be with me. Will you please save me? Now, I don't know what Jacob was expecting as an answer to this prayer, but I'm imagining it's not what he got, which is an all-night wrestling match with an unnamed stranger. So, as Phil says, just out of the blue, this man appears and begins to wrestle with Jacob. And they wrestle all night, This opponent who at one point looks like he's going to get the best of Jacob, and then it looks like Jacob is actually going to be winning this argument, and then his hip, the the strange man, injures his hip. But somewhere in this struggle, something happens to Jacob. Whether it's stubbornness, tenacity, spark of resilience that gets triggered in him, at some point he realizes that this struggle can bring him something that he needs. So he says, the man says, okay, you know, I'm done. Day's breaking. Let's call draw or whatever the man says. I'm, you know, I'm ready to go. Jacob, not letting go. I'm not letting go until you bless me. And so, somewhat of a strange blessing, the man says, what's your name? Jacob says, Jacob, and the man gives him a new name. Now, I don't know what Jacob was expecting when he prayed to be protected from his brother, to get an answer to his prayer in any way, shape, or form. But what he got was what he needed. What he got was a reminder, an affirmation, a reshaping of his identity. You are the one who struggles with God. You are the one who struggles with God and survives. No guarantee about what's going to happen next. No answer to whether or not he will be saved from the wrath of his brother or whether his brother is still even feeling wrath. Instead, an affirmation of who he was. You are the one who struggles. And in that struggle, Jacob saw God face to face. 
What God gave Jacob in that moment is, as William Sloan Coffin beautifully says, what God gives us all. Minimum protection, maximum support. There was no protection in that moment. Instead, Jacob got engagement. A God who engages with us. A God who struggled with him. A God who you can't right tell if God won't let him go or he won't let him go. And whether that being was a human, an angel, or God, that ambiguity is part of it too. But something about the struggle. Jacob saw God face to face. And that was enough for him. It was enough for him to go in to face what he was going to face with a limp, but going into it nonetheless. The desire to protect our children, the people we love, ourselves from struggle is innate. It makes sense. We don't want the people that we love to be harmed. And God knows children need to be protected in all kinds of ways. But we also know that no matter how big our love, we can't protect those we love from struggle. We know this. We can't protect ourselves from struggle. Struggle comes to us unbidden, unasked, like a stranger in the night. In those moments, what we can know is God is with us in that struggle. Somehow, God is not letting us go. Minimum protection. Maximum support. Sometimes the support doesn't really feel like support. But support nonetheless. When we think about our um, ability to be God for each other, we talk about that, you know, that, that God has no hands and feet but our hands and feet. That is what we provide as well. It would be great. It would be great if I could protect all these kids, you know, that just lined up here, if that Bible were a shield. I wish that it could in some ways. But of course it can't. And I know and trust and believe, and I can see the face of Tony, that struggles that seem like they're going to be impossible, that they're going to kill us, don't. Because of the internal sources we find within ourselves and because of the support that comes around us. The God that will not let us go. The God that shows up in our parents, our friends. To be with us, to accompany us, to remind us of our identity. Minimum protection, maximum support. God is in the struggle with us, always. Not just in those moments of grace, when we feel God on our face like sunbeams, but in those times where we can't find God at all, and all we feel is the pain in our hip, the fear about what's coming in the morning. Those are the times we need each other to come alongside to say, you can do this. I will be here. I will not leave you. And neither will God. Resilience is born of struggle. God is present with us in that. And that is good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.